All right, thank you everyone for coming to today's GBM. Um, we usually run through like our PowerPoint, but we have all of our updated information on ELMS. So if you're not on ELMS, be sure to write down your TERP mail and your UID on the form I have up front. And our speaker for today is the Director of Orthopedic Surgery at Johns Hopkins, Dr. James Fick. Thank you, Nikki. I'll just put this up here, I guess, uh, so you can hear me. It shouldn't be a problem. Well, it's really nice to talk to you. Let me just have a sense of kind of what level. You all are, what year in college? Uh, well, I'm a junior. Okay. And you're both there. Okay, good. So PowerPoint is like the most boring way to teach and talk. And, you know, I just uh, I think um, what I was doing you know, in preparation, I think Nikki invited me last summer and just to, to talk about orthopedic surgery. So are you all here because you're interested in medicine or interested in orthopedic surgery or just exploring? Well, uh, I'm personally interested in medicine. Yeah, yeah, that's good to you know. How about you? For me, it's orthopedic surgery. Okay, already committed. Yeah, all right. Yeah. I'm interested. Okay, so the, and that's not the, it's not the standard answer, I think, just uh, from this. I, I, I want to sort of start and talk through some things, and as I was putting together sort of an ill-defined class, I have to tell you it's harder to prepare a, a talk about this than it is to prepare a talk about uh, femur fractures, for instance. But um, have any of you shadowed? Orthopedic surgery before? Okay. So I'm going to start just from personal, and I'm going to keep it as raise your hand or ask questions as we go. Some of this may be apply, applied. Um, and what I'm going to do is sort of talk about how I came to be an orthopedic surgeon and sort of my story uh, for what it's worth. And um, I may throw some things in like some, you know, trauma because that's what I do. But if it's tough for anybody, hi. hi, are you, what year are you? Um, I'm a sophomore. Okay, and John, because interested in medicine, clearly. No. Not yet orthopedics, or maybe? No, 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 yet. Okay, well, I'm here to convince you, all right? Um, but then what I was going to talk just about how I came to orthopedic surgery and some of my perspectives of where I am now up at Johns Hopkins. Um, and it may make sense towards the end, okay? But also just uh, towards the end, I was going to talk a little bit about sort of the path to orthopedic surgery. And maybe that'll be helpful as you think through the next six or eight or like 15 years, okay? So it's a long haul uh, with it. But really, I, I uh, started thinking about medicine when I was in high school. And um, I kind of liked veterinary medicine, but then I ended, ended up going to, uh, you know, going to West Point. Um, and I have a story about that and how that turned out, and I think it'll fit to one of you in the audience as a, as a guy, but also to fit and talk about specifically orthopedic surgery as a profession, because that'll apply to all, all of us, okay? Um, I think that... In medicine, no matter what you're drawn to, whatever you see as you start to look at medicine, the purpose of shadowing is to explore different specialties, and they're as different as night is today. My wife is an internal medicine doctor, and my son is a um, sorry is an uh, intern right now in anesthesiology, and he just got married to a radiology resident. So we've got all over the board, and none of us probably know really what the other specialty really is about. So when we talk about people, I think about the patients, and I'm going to talk to you some about my patients, and some of them have given me stories and inspiration. And then partners, and I'm talking about the people we practice with. As you go into medicine, it's a career field, but it's also a calling. And my partners are my friends. I spend more time sometimes with my partners than I do at home. And, um, and then that's the piece that is, are your dearest and your most drawn to 
but then also thinking about the other providers, other you know the interactions, uh, and how you interact with others. So I, I think about orthopedic surgery, and I'm drawn specifically to it because it's a generally a group that are fun to be around. And when you see a, an injury, there's really a lot of visual impact. And when you fix a, an injury, there's really a lot of visual feedback for it. And so I think it's visible. Um, it's not like medicine, like my wife, who might use an, a blood pressure medicine and you can't really see it, you know? And so for us, uh, taking an x-ray and then seeing a difference is really exciting. And I think it f is very meaningful. And I'll share that, some of the stories here with you. But it's also physical. Um, a lot of people that go into orthopedic surgery have been athletes, but not everybody. And it's interesting now because less and less are former athletes and more and more have just a, a visual, spatial relationship. And so there's actually twice as many people in the in the field of orthopedic surgery that are left-handed. So anyone in here left-handed? One, same here. So it's twice as many, but it's not a discriminator. It's just uh, something that we think of as sort of a visual field type of, of specialty. And there's a lot of contact. You have a lot of contact with patients. You have a lot of contact with your, with your operating room, with your clinic. Um, it's a very engaged type of field. And it's really fun. Um, when I was looking at medicine, I thought about a lot of fields, and what I f saw was the orthopedic surgeons were some of the most fun people to be around. They liked what they did, and so I think that's a big draw. Um, sorry about the graphic, but uh, this is a very visual f aspect of a fracture. This is an open fracture, so it's sticking out. Somebody comes to you with that and it's painful, they're crying, they're bleeding, and you have to do something about it. And there's fields within orthopedics that are almost as different as specialties in medicine. And I've listed them here because I have 10 divisions in my department up at Hopkins. Uh, we have the foot and ankle, hand surgery, on oncology, which is not only just cancer, a can sarcoma or cancers of the extremities is extremely uncommon, but cysts and infections and those type of things are handled by oncologists. This is a pediatric fracture. This is a kid. In pediatrics, everybody in pediatrics does everything. They might do spine. They might do hand. They might do foot. They might do sports. And so it's sort of a field of itself just in less than 18-year-olds. So it's all of those things, but you also have parents, you know, and as you go into medicine, I think the reality is this isn't always this, um, always this fun thing. It's a lot of work to get there. I said sometimes 15 years, and I'll tell you, we can do the math. You do four years of college, and you do four years of medical school, and you do sometimes a gap year, and sometimes you do research, and then you do five years of residency, and then you do a fellowship or two, and pretty soon it's like, there's 15 years, you know, and so you think about that, and um, and then when you get there, you're thinking about who you're with and what you're doing and how specialized you are. So our, our field, our practice um, up at Hopkins has one of the top pediatric residency programs in the country and one of the top orthopedic pediatric fellowships in the country because we have um, people that are do everything, and they like that. And so my chief of the pediatrics wrote the book on this. His name is Paul Sponseller. And he is a spine surgeon and a sports surgeon, and he can do hand and feet and all that. So I think those are important. Everyone knows what total joints are, right? So when you have arthritis, I do a lot of research in arthritis. Um, when those joints are worn out, replacing them is, um, gives them a whole new lease. And I think probably, has everybody had a family member or a friend that's had a knee or a hip replacement? Anybody not? Okay. You might have and you don't know. You know it's, it's the most, so the total knee replacement is the most common orthopedic surgery in, surgery in the country now. And so it takes somebody that couldn't walk a, you know, a couple days ago, and within days after the surgery, they're walking. They're hurting, and it takes months sometimes to recover. 
But that joint replacement gives them a whole new lease on life, if you will. So I said it was hard. And I think, does this come up? Yeah. So this is a, a quote, and I think it's my favorite quote in all of the world. Have you, have you read it before? It's not the critic who counts, but the man in the, who point, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or the doer of deeds could have done them better. You can read this. But what it talks about is it's hard to be an orthopedic surgeon. And it's those 15 years, but it's also a very hard struggle to get through your grades and then get through your MCATs and then get into a medical school and then be in the top of the class in medical school. So I don't say that to intimidate you, but in the end, if you try, you can do it. And if you try it as hard as it takes, I'm going to talk a lot today about sort of where that goes and why that's a, that's a piece that I think is incredibly important. So Johns Hopkins, have you ever been up there to the Hopkins Hospital? Is everybody here from Maryland? Well, in Baltimore, Johns Hopkins was a single guy that made a lot of money on the railroads. And when before he died, he willed all of his money to create the university and the hospital. Not the school of medicine, but the hospital. And he wanted the, school, the hospital to be something that could take care of people in the city of Baltimore for eternity, forever. And that's what we do. So th they started this hospital before there were a lot of hospitals like this, Harvard, Mass General, Hopkins. And so in 1888, four people got together and they started thinking about patient care, about learning, and about research, or they called it inquiry. And Sir William Osler was one of those. And I think that in medicine, his quote is so important because it's he who studies medicine without books, sales, and uncharted sea. And he who studies medicine without patients doesn't go to sea at all. And he's lost. And so these four people patterned how we learn about medicine across the country. William Osler, William Halstead, William Kelly. There were a bunch of Williams at that time. I don't know if they had other names. but And then um, Welch. And these were internal medicine and surgery and OBGYN and pathology. And so founded the basis of what we talk about education in, in healthcare or education in medicine. So let me tell you about myself. Before I got to Hopkins, I went to West Point. I told you that before. U.S. Military Academy. And they pay for my college, and then I owe them seven years of you know, time payback. And there was no wars then. There was just over past the Vietnam War in the history. But then I went to medical school. And I went to the military medical school, which is just down the street here in Bethesda, Walter Reed. And before I was 25, I owed the, my whole life to, to this idea. And it was really something that I was okay with. It was about service because I felt like this was something important. And um, when I went to in a medical school, I found a guy that was um, just a nice guy. He was fun. He loved what he was doing. He was a shoulder surgeon. And the shadowing point that I talked about earlier is something that I think when you do shadowing, you learn what people are like. And you study them more than what your patient, what the patients they're seeing are. But you see how they interact. And I wanted to do med wilderness medicine. I was this military guy. and. You know, I was uh, excited to go climb mountains and go travel all over the world. And I found him, and, or ran into him, and, uh, and he loved what he did. So that sort of led me into orthopedic surgery. Now, what Hopkins is about this service to others and about this notion of, of taking care of people it opened 125 years ago, I think the math, I'm not sure the math, but about 125 years ago. And uh, then there was a war, and there were several wars, and the, the parallels between these is, have you ever heard of Harvey Cushing? Everyone's heard of neurosurgery. 
we compete sometimes for, patient, for, for medical students because neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery are a lot alike in spine and in competitiveness. And so the father of neurosurgery was a chief of, orth, of neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins. But he, before that, he served in World War I. And he learned how to take care of brain injuries. He took care of a lot of patients this way. And so he came back to the United States and founded neurosurgery. And this is the kind of place that they lived in, in the wars, and I'm just going to skip through it because I think about um, this. Every one of those founding forefathers had military backgrounds. I'm not, this isn't a recruiting to be in the military, but as you think about medical school, medical school is, there's a lot of ways to pay for medical school, and you can do scholarships, or you can get a loan, or you can take military time, which is what I did, and it led to this. And these guys did too. William Welch uh, was the commanding general of a, com of a hospital that went to um, France and it was there for about two years during the time of the end of World War I. And then he came back to become one of those founding fathers. How is this connected to orthopedics? The word orthopedics means straight child. And Nicholas Andre described this because of bracing, where you could take bracing and you could straighten a child out. And William Baer was also trained by one of these guys, William Halstead, and he was the Surgeon General for the state of Maryland. And in World, in World War I, we sent a hospital over to um, France. And we sent 20 orthopedic surgeons. At the time, they were surgeons. They weren't called orthopedic surgeons, but they came back. And Dr. Baer started orthopedics at Johns Hopkins. It was the first unit, first residency in the country. So now back to my story. I made it through West Point. I was accepted to medical school. And I learned from William, from William Harriman, who was a renowned orthopedic surgeon at the time, about how fun it was. And then I applied, and I got into residency with really no interview. It was a surprise. I just happened lucky, okay? You know what? Uh, it, we kind of talk about luck, and it means preparation and opportunity. And I got the opportunity to be an orthopedic surgeon, and I didn't realize how lucky I was. And I did a fellowship in both trauma and foot and ankle surgery. And in the military, you can't wear beards, but I got to do that. So I got to go to Germany and train in a fellowship in, uh, in Germany in trauma. And um, that led me into the military practice. And um, you all were alive in 9-11. Do you any remember this? Do you remember 9-1-1? Not really? Okay. Um, it was a Tuesday, and I had clinic on Tuesday. And it would change the world. Now you have security in airports. You can't carry even a soda can onto the airplanes. It changed how we think about the rest of our world. We think about security and all that, but it changed medicine. And so I was in San Antonio, Texas in 9-11. And I didn't know how much it would change me. But I spent from 2001 until 2013 taking care of soldiers. And those soldiers were something that led me to think about medicine more than I did as a medical student or as a resident. I told you about luck. And now I'm going to tell you about serendipity. These are two words that I think are important because luck really isn't luck, it's when you prepare and then you have opportunities and you say yes. And serendipity is a misunderstood word, but it, when you get an opportunity such as shadowing or you have a chance to meet a person like Dr. Harriman and you say yes, then things happen. And so I was in the military and I happened to be at Brook Army Medical Center and you've heard of Walter Reed because it's just across, just down the road. And Brook and Walter Reed started taking all the people that were injured from Iraq and Afghanistan. And I really realized that it was something bigger than us. And it was something important for everyone. And so I saw this kind of stuff. I went to Iraq in 2005. 
and I was a senior surgeon, senior doctor for a combat support hospital. And we took care of people every day that got blown up from blasts like this. And it defined more of what I thought about medicine. And when I came back from that, I was still at San Antonio, but this building on your right is called the Center for the Intrepid. And we created that, and we, we, we created it. We were given a very generous donation from a civilian person who said, we want to help the warriors. And this is one of the most advanced rehabilitation centers in the world. And so we took care of really literally thousands of soldiers and Marines and what have you that had injuries to their limbs and had burns. And um, those patients, a lot of them have continued to be friends of mine for um, over a decade now. And we talk about this because I'm not a warrior. I was a doctor. And I thought about medicine in the way of taking care of patients. And I was serendipity. I had the, that opportunity, if you will, to go to a war and to take care of people in a war zone. And that's, you know, I told you how I would think about myself. Before I went to Iraq, I was thinking I would get out of the military and I'd go practice in a nice little place in my home in Colorado and it would be okay. You know, it would be just fun and we'd just keep having fun. When I came back from Iraq, I had a sense that we in medicine have a calling and uh, orthopedic surgery, it's the same way. And you take care of patients that are blown up, you take care of patients that have injuries, you take care of patients that need hip replacements or joint replacements, or, or scoliosis. You can take care of little kids that have uh, born with deformities. And um, so really that's what it is about. Um, these are some warriors that I've taken care of. This guy, I'm in the red, and the guy that with the prosthesis, you see this? This is his prosthesis. Can you? He had lost his hip from a war injury. And before him, nobody could, everybody, everyone that had that type of injury sat in a wheelchair. Some of them would walk with this kind of prosthesis, but he runs, and he's run a marathon. Anyone run here? Ever run? Tom? He ran a 409 marathon in the New York Marathon. And this run was us, was him running a 50 kilometer trail run uh, with it. He was, he ran, and the picture was just showing, he, he wore out his shoe, so he put his shoe, he went barefoot with his good leg, and he wore his shoe on the prosthesis so it didn't skid. That's the kind of courage they have. This other guy was uh, Green Beret, they call him Special Forces, and um, he ended up with a bad injury and he wanted me to do an amputation. And we ended up doing a fusion and that center for the intrepid created a brace that he could run with and he went back to become a special forces commander. And we, I saw, this is a picture of him 10 years later after his, his command. And this guy you might have heard of, we've just had a handful of people that have had the Congressional Medal of Honor but Leroy Petrie was injured on Memorial Day 2008 in Afghanistan. And he picked up a grenade that was thrown under, on, into his fighting area with his soldiers, and he threw it around a corner. He'd already been shot through both of his thighs and he couldn't walk. So he's sitting there and the people are, his, his partners are shooting back at these, these, uh, the enemy, and they throw a grenade in this area. He picks a grenade up and throws it around a corner and it blew off his hand. And so he was evacuated from Afghanistan back to San Antonio in 2008. And I told you about people and patients and partners, right? And so Leroy Petrie was a person I'd never met before, but I got a phone call on Memorial Day of 2008, and I was on call. And I was called by a guy who was one of my residents in, in San Antonio 
on a satellite phone from the middle of Afghanistan and said, I have a patient from New Mexico and he's coming your way. And when he came, we took care of him, we closed up, we finished up the, the surgeries. And uh, nine months later, he ran and I ran a marathon together right here. And we have stayed in touch since that time. He stayed in the military. He went back to Iraq or Afghanistan nine more times. He did it to motivate others because he was serving others and he was thinking about this. But he wasn't a trigger puller, as we say, but he was a motivator. And in 2011, Barack Obama awarded him the Congressional Medal of Honor. And he got to bring a hundred of his closest friends to uh, the White House. And we got to meet the president and meet his uh, vice president and see Leroy Petrie get the Medal of Honor. And uh, so it's been a privilege to work for people like him. Part of the commitment of soldiers is to defend our freedom. And that's really kind of what this is about and why I was in the military for 30 years. His commitment to serving and talking about this was that he traveled around for 100 days and talked in, in like places like this, universities, not to recruit people, but just talk about service. And he asked me to go with him. And so I went on a couple trips with him, and we were able to talk about our relationship. And I text, and I get texts from him periodically, still to this day. So it's really something I think about medicine. If you love medicine, because it's fun and it's, exciting, then you get more reward because you're serving others. You know who Albert Schweitzer was? Anyone know who he was? He went to the Nile and he was a infectious, he became an infectious disease doctor, but he lived his life out in Africa taking care of people that needed this. Is, yeah, it comes up. Okay, it kind of cuts off here, but you guys can see the whole quote, right? And so that's a lot about orthopedic surgery. And that's about all of medicine. So when I think about that, I'm going to transition a little bit. And now we're a pretty unified group of people. Um, this is one of my residents. We were fixing a fracture. And you can see the fracture in the background. And you can see her putting an external fixator on this, this leg right here. And... Um, I have this in there because I think about her a lot. She's, um, she's doing research on ethics in medicine. And she's in the South Pacific right now. And she's doing a year of time away. Um, and she's doing research and she's taking care of patients. And she wants to be one of those pediatric orthopedic surgeons. But in this picture, you look at her and she's not a big person. And... She, like the x-ray machine is almost as big as she is. It doesn't have to be some big, beefy football player kind of person that does orthopedic surgeon. And she's one of our best residents. Now, I'm going to show you some visual pictures. I want, these are taken off of Google images. If you Google students, what do you see? I want some talking. Smiling faces, yeah. Young people? Aesthetically pleasing. All right. It's, it's images that are on, on media, right? So I, saw pretty, I see pretty much a mix of, uh, of humans. And then if you look at doctors, what do you see here? Similar? Maybe a little older. Pretty wide. If you do, if you Google orthopedic surgeons, what do you see here? What? A lot of men. I see a lot of men. Yeah. I'm going to say that I see a lot of white men in this. I'm provoking this because I think this is important to our profession. Where are women in orthopedic surgery and where are underrepresented minorities in, in orthopedic surgery? 
I do this on purpose because when I left the military in 2013, I, I did a lot of thinking about our profession. And I thought, if we don't look like our patients, if we're not like our patients, then we don't relate as much. And orthopedic surgery is something I love to get up and come talk about. And I love to you know, show you pictures of patients. And I'm proud of the relationships that I've had. I, I, my reputation with my residents and my students is I give my cell phone to all my patients. I don't, you know, they don't rarely call me, but when they need me, they call me. Usually it's the security that they feel because they can call me. But that relationship is important. And so this is a big need. It's a big need and it shouldn't be a big fear. So what we started in 2013 up in Baltimore is something called the Perry Initiative. So those pictures of patients, a lot of what I did in the military was rehabilitation of amputation patients, of people with limb loss. And a woman named Jacqueline Perry was one of the first orthopedic surgeons. And she was the first orthopedic surgeon that took on rehabilitation as a profession. And she took care of people that were paralyzed. She took care of people that lost limbs. She was a physical therapist at Walter Reed. And then she became an orthopedic surgeon. In spite of you know, not having any people to be mo mentors or models. And so the Jacqueline Perry Initiative is something that we do every year. And we have high school students, we have college students, and we have them come to, and they apply for it. And then we spend a day with them. We show them what orthopedic surgery is like. It's not just um, big broken bones and big drills and powers, hammers and things like that. It's all kinds of stuff. So I'm going to show you this next picture. This was a team, a resident and staff team on call. Miho Tanaka is a sports medicine doctor. She scopes people. She has a, a World Series ring from the, uh, not Baltimore, but the Cardinals. She was in St. Louis and we recruited her to come uh, to create something called the Women's Sports Medicine Program. So she was the attending. You see University of Maryland here, but uh, Allie is, um, is the resident I showed you earlier that's now in the South Pacific. And Laura was the chief resident, and she's doing foot and ankle. And these two medical students were with us on rotations. And everybody's kind of happy, and it looked kind of fun. And that wasn't staged. That was just the call team, and they took care of this. Now, this, this isn't very impressive, right? There's just a bruise on the bottom of the foot. If you think of an x-ray, that little ligament on the circle, that can destroy somebody's career. If you're a world-class lacrosse player, like this person, they get injured and their sport is over. And so you can think of, we've talked about horrible injuries where people lose their whole leg. And we've talked about sports medicine. We've talked about small injuries uh, with it. But this is an x-ray of, I don't, it doesn't project too well, does it? I think it's, it's real grainy, so I'm sorry. But um, that's a really small little x-ray, and it's not very visible. But those, that's an injury that could destroy a person's career and render them unable to walk for the rest of their life. And so this is the way we fixed it. Shows up. Yeah. Just put some screws in there. And just something as simple as that, and about, I think that I took these screws out three months later, and this person was the MVP for the uh, lacrosse team. And um, the individual is uh, one of our Michael Jordans of lacrosse and USA lacrosse now. Uh, but it, I think about grit. Have you heard of grit? Have you heard of Angela Duckworth? She, taught, she wrote a book. She published and she studied this. And it turns out that uh, I met her because she did this study uh, looking at West Point. And West Point's hard, and medical school's hard, and getting into medical school is hard, and then getting into residency is hard. We just yesterday downloaded 790 applications for orthopedic surgery, and we get to pick six. So it's really hard to get in. 
but that doesn't mean it's not impossible. And one of the things about it is the secret to it. I think about West Point, and I think about grit, and I think about how hard things are. It's not any different than what you're going through now as pre-med. Is, you know, do, what do you do if you don't get all A's? Are you out of the picture? No, you're not. But you have to think about ways that, that you can work hard and make up for it. So I mean, I, these are more than I... I think um, th this is her equation. So grit is when you think about effort and talent. And it's not simply that you have raw talent. You have to take the talent and the intellect that you have in school, and you have to work and study hard and, and make achievement. If you have talent and you spend a lot of times, you heard of Michael Jordan, and he, he talked about doing 10,000 shots on goal before he could get a free throw, and he could reliably do that. And that is lots and lots of effort. And so that's the study part of this. And then once you have your talent and effort, it gives you skill. And that's what we train in residency, and then skill plus effort equals the achievement. It, that's the way to get there. So I was not an AOA. I was not in National Honor Society even in high school. Secret. I ended up without getting a, a residency slot because somebody else canceled out of it and I was what was left. And I talk about this as second place. And I wasn't the smartest in residency, but I worked hard and I was able to get to become the senior orthopedic surgeon in the military. And when I was thinking about getting out of the Army, I ended up going to you know, war and took care of people. And that's just effort. It's just effort. And so when I ended up looking at places to go afterwards, everybody thinks about Johns Hopkins as one of the top places in the country. And they were looking for a position. They were looking for a chair of surgery or chair of orthopedics. And I didn't even think I could try. And so where this ties in together is I didn't apply the first time. And then almost six months later, they were still looking. Somebody said, you should just apply. And I thought, why not? So the connection is serendipity. I said, why not? Let's give it a try. And I got the job. And I've been there since 2013. And I've had the privilege then of leading an orthopedic department and doubling the size and creating something that is important to me, and that is why I'm here tonight, uh, really to talk about a field that I love, and I hope you all will come check it out, and doing it in a place where I can change the face of orthopedics. If you, any of you do Instagram or Twitter, um, I'm pretty active on social media, and there's something called Faces of Orthopedic Surgery. And it's developing this in a way that is qualified people. And now, after five, six years, we have women and underrepresented minorities in every field, every one of those specialties that I talked about. And so there are people that will be mentors and examples. And that gives an opportunity. And so what I d deleted from this slide deck was like graphs, because that's the last thing you want to see. But the graphs, if you think of all the specialties in medicine, and you think of where women are drawn to, they're not usually drawn to orthopedic surgery. But because what we think about that is because they're not applying because they don't see examples in leadership or real life practicing surgeons. And so that's a part of that. So my residency director, and vice chair for education is now must well, she Don Laporte is a um, is the is the rising president of our w women's national orthopedic society, and um, she was there before I got there. She was the only one, and she was the second professor in orthopedic surgery. And now we have eleven women in faculty, and it's been a big change. And. I lead because I have the opportunity to change and influence this in a way that influences, hopefully, what you see. Um, I, I'd like to just stop and take some time, I think, and just talk a little bit about, if we want, 
some questions you might have about how do you get into orthopedic surgery, maybe, and we could talk about questions. That's sort of what I left this up here for. So any questions or thoughts or do you know how to get there? You got to do MCATs. Yeah. And you got to do well on MCATs to get into medical school, but it's not the only thing. So if you do MCATs and you, if there's anyone, no, you were, you're all juniors or sophomores, right? People who are seniors are already headed that direction, or do you have some people that are seniors that are in your group? I'm yeah. Here, but I'm senior, yeah right. Okay. Why did you take a gap year? Well, I love research, and I've been doing a lot of ophthalmology research, so I might do a NIH post postdoc mm -hmm. research fellowship, probably, or work for a pharmaceutical company. Okay. I think um, I think gap years are more and more common. Um, sometimes if you're not sure what you want to do, it gives you, a, you know, some clarity. And sometimes if you do research and you make sure you got your name on some papers, right, um, it helps make your application stronger. And I didn't, um, you know, I would say I wasn't an AOA and I didn't do great on grades. So doing something like a gap year gives you the opportunity to you know, to really become competitive. But I also think the downside sometimes is that you, um, you know, you end up, you, you might get distracted. Now we talk a lot of, in medicine now about burnout. And orthopedic surgery, for instance, has one of the lowest burnouts of all the surgical fields and below average, like less than the median, less than norm, of people who complain about or are diagnosed with burnout. And it's generally because it's hard to get into, and so people think about it a lot. I think a gap year is really helpful for that because it gives you conviction that it's something that's worthwhile um, with it. We don't know how to test for skills. We don't, when we do interviews, I told you that we have 700 and, what, 790 applicants we just opened the, you know, they they have to apply middle of September, and then we interview in December, and we interview them for who they are, not really what they what their scores were, or how well they can tie their shoe or tie a knot or put a screw in or those kind of things, because we can usually teach those. The hardest parts are, you know, what a person's like. And I think the best advantage of doing a gap year is finding yourself. If you can understand what you want to do, then it's um, it's really valuable. So, are you doing that? Got to take some time and think about it. What other questions are there? Everything's fair. Sure. Um, how much research do you expect a medical student? To be competitive for residency? Um, the average, so I'll tell you data. Um, I expect them to do some, and I expect when, when someone has done research, I ask them about what they've done. So if they were not first author, but they're in a paper, the average is 1.2 papers for orthopedic surgery. So you can't do 0.2 papers, but you know, over the course of Hundreds. I see people that have some, some people have 10 or 12 papers and they've done gap years, they've done research fellowships, they've done, uh, been a research assistant for time, but most everybody has at least one paper that they're in. And then that's just one small part of it. But I think it does help you. What we look for is, um, is also what have they done, you know, whether it's a sport or, you know, uh, Peace Corps or, you know, some type of service, you know, that, that I look for those as well. And we don't get, we don't give, you know, a scoring criteria. It's not that rigid. But I think we, people have studied how much the average uh, medical student who gets in has, and it's like 1.2. So 
I just want to see some. I don't think we're absolute either. You know, if, if someone goes to medical school and they've done some research in ophthalmology or, you know, the studying flies, it's okay. They've done some research. If they can tell us what, you know, what they've done and what their understanding of the process is. So, good. What else did you guys come to hear about? You can, yeah, keep. What is your perspective on attending new medical schools, such as Kaiser Permanente? It, it, it's just, is it, how is it going to impact your yeah. I don't. I think that the way we do it is when we have all those people that screen. Here, I'll, I've got another slide. Um, the, what we do is we screen the academic records, and we think of where they're from. And so when we have, I have over 50 faculty, and we set up of those seven, we'll have, by the time all of the applications are in, we'll have maybe 900 applicants. And we look at their academic records, we look at where they went, uh, but we don't give a, you know, a premium to Harvard versus, you know, a, a, a junior college if they got the degree uh, with it. And I think that the, the important part of, of <coughs> where, you know, what, what some, where somebody's gone is what they've learned. And when it's a new school, sometimes it's hard because they haven't, it hasn't proven them, itself as a, you know, as a, as a competitive school. I think more about it if you're, uh, we have a harder time looking at international schools. We, we actually have a fair number of international students applying. And um, we have, Hopkins has a lot of international undergraduates that have come there, but we also look at people. In fact, this last kind of cycle of rotations, we had somebody from Jordan, we had somebody from uh, Lebanon, we had somebody from, uh, I want to say France. I'm pretty sure they were from France. But most of the Europe has their own system but we look at you know at those, and, but that's harder because if they don't do a clinical rotation, it's very different. So the medical schools, uh, even so, DOs. Here's a, another maybe a different side of that question: is DO versus MD really has no difference, and so the schools are very competitive, and they can get in. We have orthopedic surgeons that are DOs that are the MDs, and they're I've seen them, and they're equal. So that help. As you look at stu schools, you you get into the one you can get into, and and then you do the best you can. So, I asked about Kaiser Permanente because it provides free tuition for the first time. There's more and more medical schools that are doing that. NYU. Yeah. <laughs> so, do you think that people are flocking to those? Is it really really crazy competitive to get in those? I don't know. I don't know. It's well, NYU is a you know highly ranked medical school. Um, Hopkins has just come up. You know, the undergraduate tuition is now um, loan free. So not the medical school yet, but uh, you know might get there soon. I don't know, but I think there's a trend towards that. So we're happy to see it. And there's always. There is the military. You know, I met my wife in the military because she, she went to Berkeley and they didn't have a medical school. So she applied to military medical school and she went there and we met. So she did her time and got out and, you know, it wasn't that bad. We have three kids and they still talk to us. One of them even went into medicine, but they didn't do you know, medicine. They didn't do either of our specialties. He didn't do any of our specialties. Um, Yes. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. 
Yes, it does. That's natural. But it's also, you know, we've looked at this. Um, it is a natural response. You're hurting a person. You're cutting a person. And it does, it goes away, but it also, because they're under anesthesia, I, you know, I think the hardest part is in, in orthopedics is doing fracture reductions. You know, if some kid has a broken arm, trying to reduce the fracture is you don't want to do it when they're awake. You know, you want to do it when they're asleep and those kind of things. But you're, you know, you get used to um, that reaction. And it's not to be, you know, I, I, I ask you not to be fearful of that. I mean, realize it's, it's not uncommon. And then over time, you, you understand that you're helping somebody by hurting them in a way. Yeah. Please. How do you spend your time, like, weekly, so? Yeah. So, so I, because I'm the chairman of, of a program, um, I have a lot of administrative work. And so that's hard to, you know, to relate to. Um, but a typical or a typical surgeon um, would operate two days a week, and they would see clinic two days a week. Um, and so, for instance, let's see, it's Tuesday. Yesterday, I was in clinic, and I start my clinic at 7.30, and I finished by 5, and I had seen 25 patients. And um, some of those are patients that are uh, I know that I've already done surgery on, and they're recovering. And some of those are new patients that I've never seen before. Some have fractures. Some of them have arthritis. It's really varied. But um, some of those I've been treating with bracing or things like that that are not surgery. Then they never go to surgery. And then some we see that are new that I've never met before. We decide they need surgery, and we schedule them. And then tomorrow I'll have an operating room. And my operating room starts also at 7.30. If I have patients that are in the hospital, you know, we don't admit patients very often in orthopedic surgery. Um, they, they'll come in, and the patients that I operate on tomorrow, one of them is going home after surgery. And the other two will stay overnight for surgery. And so then I see them the next day, and Thursdays are our, always our teaching day. Um, and so we have grand rounds, and we have lectures, and, and so we'll see them first thing in the morning. I get up pretty early, um, but I get up early because I've got to do, you know, all the administrative stuff as well as taking care of patients. And then, um, and then we start our lectures, you know, that the morning of Thursdays is from 8 to noon, and the residents and everybody's together learning and talking about cases and things like that. So does that help? And so you just... You know, get up and do it again each day. I take call um, in orthopedic surgery. Pretty much everybody takes call, and so whatever comes in the emergency room is, you know, is a fair game. You have to take care of them. So that'll be. But that's if you're a resident, you're in there for 24 hours. Orthopedics. I mean, all the residencies now are are different because you. It seems like a lot, and you say you're lim you can only work 80 hours, and that seems like a ton, right? But 80 hours goes by fast when you're in there, and you have to have a day off every, every week, and you, if you work 24 hours, like on call, then you're going to get the next 24 hours off. And so 80 hours is a lot of time, and it's a lot of time in the hospital, and it kind of goes back to saying, when you shadow, really keep your eyes open and spend time with... Uh, you know, with, with people and watch how they interact. Watch, look for the people that are happy. And you could even do data-driven, kind of look at what the burnout rates of different fields are. But I think everybody's different. If you are doing research in ophthalmology and you're working with ophthalmologists and they, you know, and that's inspiring to you, then I think that's really the thing that draws you. And the more exposure you have to different fields, it's... You know, it, 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 you're actually seeing what it's like to do that. So as I can talk about what my day is like all, all the time, but if you don't spend time with them, then you don't really get that sense. What are you thinking about in medicine? Um, have you done shadows?
Good. Keep testing it out. You know, I, I, I think um, if you'd spend time in, and by the time you're halfway through medical school, a lot of times people are pretty set on their ways. And what we were just, you know, if we, we did, I didn't do this study, but we've looked at population of medical students and who goes into orthopedic surgery and who does, who goes into different fields. And all across the fields in medicine, typically men come into medical school not having any idea what they want to do. They kind of think something's cool and then they spend time and they decide whether it is or not. And often women come into medical school with senses of what they want to do and they most often stick with it. And those are just demographics. So this PERI initiative that we, we do is working towards showing orthopedic surgery to college students or even high school students and saying it's not um, scary. But what we do actually is um, we take drills on sticks and we put screws in sticks and we, we cut through, uh, we take a scalpel and we, we cut through pig's feet and then uh, suture them and we do some things that are like that to get exposed to it, you know, just to understand it so that it kind of takes that um, strange feeling away. And it's different when you're cutting on a live person than a pig. It's different than when you're cutting on a cadaver than, uh, you know, than a pig. But we also, in medical school, take, we just did it last week. Within the first couple of months of medical school, everybody's learning anatomy. Have you ever seen a cadaver? It's, it's hard to think of them as a person because they're, they don't, they smell like, you know, formaldehyde. They smell, you know, bad. They're stiff. Um, but when you open them up, the muscles are there, but everything doesn't look like it's alive. You have to peel it apart and, and do everything. So it's not very, you know, exciting. And a lot of different medical schools approach medicine, orthopedic, or anatomy in different ways. In our school, the veterinarians teach it. And I don't know, you know, the anatomy is similar in, in dogs, I guess. But, but they understand the anatomy. They're good at teaching it. But they don't understand why it's so important to understand where one muscle goes and where another muscle goes. And so we partner with them and we come in, the, in there and we we'll sneak, we don't sneak in, we come in the night before with a chisel and we'll cut a, we'll break a bone. And then we'll operate so that the medical students are actually cutting through a cadaver to get to a bone and then putting screws and plates on it and fixing the, the fracture. And so they can understand, well, if you cut through this area, and there's a nerve there, and you cut the nerve, then it's going to damage the person. So you have to understand that that's where the nerve is, and you have to pull it to the side. And here's an artery, and you know, no relationships on anatomy. And we've been doing that for about five years now in, in our medical school. And it gives everybody an opportunity to hold a knife like they would as a surgeon, and not just you know, scraping through the cadaver to dissect it and understand where the structures are, but why they're there, and you know, sort of the relationships. So to give, just guided to give, give a real experience of it. I never did ophthalmology. I never rotated on ophthalmology, so I didn't know, you know, and you don't get exposure, then you never know what it's like. So see it. Yeah. Yeah. Is it, how difficult is it to manage a career a research point for the senior with, you know, being in a, in a surgical field? Um, it's not. It's a choice. Um, I'm going to, I have these, this is kind of dry stuff, but I'm going to get to one place and show you, uh, see this. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, everybody has 24 hours. These are my rules for success. Um, that's my Twitter and Instagram handle too. But I think if you focus this, I chose to go into leadership because I could influence the whole population and then maybe the profession. And I do some research, but I don't. It's not what I love to do. What I love to do is to uh, is to get so other people can do it. But I have people that have NIH grant funding. I have an NIH grant. Um, so I think about what your your question was, Nikki, about how do, what's my day like? 
and I have to squeeze in all those things. So balancing a life, whether you're a parent or a spouse or a researcher or a partner, all of those things kind of factor into it. And so I think you just think about the, the, the ro this idea of rotating priorities. And today, my priority was to have something that would mean something to you all and to drive down here and do this so um, we could make, you know, so I could expose this profession to you. Tomorrow, my priority will be taking care of three people who are hurting and try to make them return to function. And tonight, after this, my priority is going to be to spend some time with my wife, who I don't see very often, you know. And, and then on Thursday, I'm going to fly to Chicago, and I'm going to teach a course that is about clinician scientists and how you can be, um, you can be a good surgeon. This is specific to orthopedics, how I can be an, a good orthopedic surgeon and study that a lot and then dive very deeply into the causes. In my particular area, um, there's two areas that I have grant funding on, and one is about uh, basic sciences in arthritis. And so I want to know why when you break your ankle, um, you, some people get arthritis and some don't, and how we can cure that. But on the same side, I want to also study disasters because I took care of people in Mosul, Iraq, when they were blowing people up and they would get hurt. And how do we make sure that we get as many people to survive as we can? And that's not basic science research, but it's more uh, demographic research and, and uh, public health research. So it's, if you love research, then you could be a PhD and do it. If you love research about patients, then you'd be an MD and then dedicate some of your time. As a chair of a department, when I bring somebody into the department that's a faculty member, now this is long, this is 15 years away, not really 15, maybe 12, okay? But when I recruit somebody in to Johns Hopkins, I want them to be able to do both. And I realize that they, they're going to be better at one than another. And they might be better at teaching, or better at research, or better at patient care. But I want them to be okay at all of them. And then they have to balance. And when they start, they get the focus. So you, you find out what you love. That's what you're doing now with your, your research year and your gap year, right? So I think you balance it by not doing too much at once. My wife says, um, I have a hard time saying no to things. So um, I think when you asked me at first, I didn't respond right away, but um, what I've learned is she, she says, this is the plate I have. And it's kind of like penguins and an iceberg, okay? This is a theory of learning, is every, there's an iceberg, and you keep putting penguins on it, pretty soon penguins will fall off somewhere. And so the harder you work, the more penguins fall off. And if you work too hard, then the iceberg shrinks. And you burn out. And so you've got to protect the time you have and the space you have so that you can do it well and you do the important piece. Does that help? That's kind of philosophic, but I don't know. That's, that's a philosophy question. So does, did these all make sense? Did you see these? This is um, something my residents love, and one of them asked me to make a card for this. And um, I think it makes sense, but one of the, number three is something about surgical. If you do any kind of surgery, this is uh, this is if, if you've been in academic or teaching um, rounds or anything, you you've shadowed, but you've you shadowed with private practice doctors when they're learning. Like we have every morning, we have a, a conference, and a resident has to stand up here and present a case. And they'll present what they did, they'll present the patient, they'll present what they thought, what, they, what their plan was, how they did it, and how it went. And if, it was, if they made a mistake, how, how they took care of the mistake. And the staff all the, are back in the, you know, back of the room and they're saying, well, what about this? And what about this? Have you seen a 
what's the house? It's off now, right? What is, is any sent one scene reruns the house? That guy was not a nice guy. And that's where we to think about sharks. So learning to, if you're in the operating room and you know something bad happens, we teach them to be handle stress. And surgery has you have to handle stress. So that's a long story. But when you're in, under stress, don't show stress. You learn to handle it. And we teach that in residency. So we don't teach it by making you do push-ups, but it goes back to that notion of grit. If you haven't read the book Grit and you get some free time, it's really good to read, understand it, because I think that's about surgery. Yes, you had a question? Oh, okay. Well, th I, I hope this was helpful. And um, if you want to come do some shadowing in an academic center, you're welcome to come up. And if you don't want to do it in orthopedics, the Wilmer Eye Institute is one of the leading you know, ophthalmology departments in the country. So there's a lot of opportunities. Do you guys have, have those through your group? Do you have some you have some connections for shadowing and do that? A little bit, yeah. But not a broad spectrum of specialties. Okay, well here's a resource. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Is it okay if you save a copy of the